What is your take on the Ozempic craze? So when we look at Ozempic, yeah. Um, yeah. there's a, a little bit of a disconnect. It's starting to get a little bit better because there's more education around it. When it first came out, there was no way that there was enough education to tell people that when you start using it, the very first thing to go is lean mass and bone. So you're going to become a very sarcopenic, chalky skeleton type person, and you're going to be on this stuff for life. What's your take on peptides? Do you believe in them? Uh, the, some of them for specific healing properties. So if you look at the uh, BPC-157, right. which is your, right? Yeah. So if you're looking at that for tissue healing, there's a lot of rodent data out there and a little bit of human research out there that shows it's beneficial. But when you look at something like WADA and Informed Sports saying it's a banned substance, you know there's something there that makes it work. Um, as for the other peptides, they're kind of like floating out there with not a lot of science behind it. Um, yeah, so that's another one to be a case by case. It's like, why do you want to use it? What do you think you need it for? What are the other things that we can do to invoke the same change? But for tissue healing, yeah, maybe we'll look at the BPC. So Right. That's the most benign one of the ones that, exactly. uh, that we're talking about. Um, I need to ask you about Ozempic, right? Because it would yeah. be remiss if I didn't. What is your what is your take on the Ozempic craze? Yeah, I think I got slammed from another podcast about talking about this, but I'm going to say it again anyway. So when we look at Ozempic, um, yeah, we there's a a little bit of a disconnect. It's starting to get a little bit better because there's more education around it. When it first came out, there was no way that there was enough education to tell people that when you start using it, the very first thing to go is lean mass and bone. So you're going to become a very sarcopenic, chalky skeleton type person, and you're going to be on this stuff for life. When we start looking at Ozempic as a tool in the toolbox for losing a significant amount of weight, not our vanity pounds of 10 to 15 pounds, but that significant amount of weight that plagues two thirds of American population. Yes, it can be a tool. It can help with appetite control to dampen the noise, the food noise that happens so much around the ultra processed food and the cravings and gives you the opportunity to put healthier habits into play, like learning how to lift, what are wise food choices. So you finally can dampen that crazy food noise to put in strategies to help maintain weight loss and to build lean mass. That's how I view Ozempic as having, having a role in help, trying to combat some of the obesity epidemic. I have problems when women who come to me and go, how can I microdose Ozempic because I want to lose my 10 to 15 vanity pounds? I'm like, no, we don't do that. There are other things, and maybe you are learning to live with an extra five pounds on your body, which is probably beneficial as you get older, because we want a little bit more weight as we get older, so we don't have enough reserve if we get sick. So there's nuances within it as well. Um, I feel for people who really need it for diabetic control because of everyone now using it for weight loss. I'm interested in the research that's coming out about um, Parkinson's and Alzheimer's about Ozempic and the GLP-1s helping with that. So that's early day research. So right now it's a tool in the toolbox and we have to really look at lifestyle to accelerate that tool. You know, it's funny you mentioned the microdosing, right? That was my next part of the question because um, that's what I'm noticing a lot of people who, like people who are doing that, people in the health and wellness longevity space, claim mm -hmm. that uh, the microdosing is really good for inflammation and all these other health benefits. And so they're microdosing. And these are people who don't need to lose any weight, really. Mm -hmm. Maybe, like you mm -hmm. said, five pounds here and there. Um, do, what, do you, what, do you, what do you say about that? Like, do you, believe, is, do you believe the microdosing for the inflammation and all these other longevity uh, reasons. Is there any truth to that at all? Or is it just people just having misinformation and just jumping on the bandwagon because they're a little thinner? Yeah, I part of it's misinformation. And part of it is um, people become inherently lazy and don't want to 
And I say that and I'll take full ownership of yeah. that statement. Because um, when we look at exercise, regardless of intensity, duration, um, mode, whatever it is, it's a super powerful uh, stress that gets put on the body and the body responds in kind. So yes, you're going to have inflammation after exercise, but the subsequent response is your body upregulates its anti inflammatory and antioxidative responses. So the chronic use of exercise improves oxidation and infla inflammation. It also improves autophagy. So all the things that people are talking about by using pharmaceuticals for longevity or trying to biohack by using microdoses of this and peptides and stuff, you can use exercise. And it's just understanding what kind and dosage is not the blanket ACSM 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous activity, which is based on male data, right? right so we have right. to be very nuanced in what we're talking about. You know, also with when it comes to Ozempic, if someone were to compound that with strength training, would that mm -hmm. offset the problem of bone density loss and the muscle mass? Would it actually balance yep. itself out? You have to be very dedicated to the strength training and eating protein. Because when we look at protein, protein and a high protein diet induces satiation and increases our natural production of our GLP 1s. So if we are looking at using Ozempic as well yeah. as strength training and high protein, you're going to get better body composition, better appetite control, better appetite uh, hormone regulation. And it's going to allow you to get off the Ozempic when you get to a certain point, which is decided by you and your doctor or whatever your lifestyle choice is. So, okay. And then, I, by the way, I just remember something else to going back to the other part about training. Uh, we talked about menopause and perimenopause training. What about if you're not at that place? What type of training should someone actually do if they're in their 20s or 30s? That's different than when they're 40s, 50s, 60s. This part. is a time, yeah. Well, this is a time <laughs> where you can play. You can play a little bit. You can yeah. try a lot of things. It depends on your hormone profile. It's like what kind of if you're using hormonal contraception, what kind is it? Is it over the, uh, oral contraceptive? Is it a marina? Is it a copper IUD? All of those have different responses within the body, which is going to affect the kind of training and how you feel about training. Naturally cycling, are you finding changes in your bleed pattern? Are you finding changes in the length of your cycle? Well, those are beginning stop gaps and warning signs that you're putting your body under too much stress. But for the most part, you want to find a goal and the basic idea of periodization of both cardiovascular and strength is beneficial. If you're someone who wants to go the endurance route, sweet, you can. But put some strength training in there. You don't have to put it your mainstay, but you want to have a strong, resilient body regardless of where you are in your life. And you can pepper it in your 20s and your 30s with different adventures. What else happened with your your habits and, and your routine? My habits, yeah. So I am a kind of person that needs to get up before anyone else in the household so I can have 10 to 15 minutes of absolute no noise because that's how I can reset and recenter. Uh, then I'd like to do some training, either go for a swim in the pool or the ocean um, a couple of days a week. Strength training, definitely three to four times a week. Um, after training, come home, have food, do the email thing, go through all the meetings, have some quiet time, get some work done. Then my daughter comes home from school. We do some stuff. Then I do some more work. Then, uh, take the dog for a walk, make dinner, have dinner, uh, have conversations and maybe read with my daughter. And then I try to be in bed by nine thirty, ten o'clock. I get up maybe six thirty seven. Um, but I'm also the most fatigued person at the end of the day, and I want to go to bed before everyone else. <laughs> but I make a priority. <laughs> I'm like, I need to go to sleep now, and yeah. I need to sleep. I might do some reading before falling asleep, make sure it's a cool, dark room, because I don't like to be hot when I'm sleeping. And I get very agitated if my sleep is disrupted, because I'm like, I need sleep. I love right, sleep. Right, right. Yeah. yeah, especially when you're active like you are. Do you train people still regularly or? No, I don't. Um, I advise people who do train 
And every once in a while, I'll take someone on, especially if, if it's a, a really complex, like sticky moment where people are trying to do all the things and they're stuck. I wish I had the bandwidth to be able to get out there on boots on the ground to help more people on an individual basis. But there's only one of me at the moment. Right. Exactly. What Can I just ask you a couple more questions and I can hopefully sure. see you when you're here? I want you to yeah. talk. Can you tell me what you think the most underrated um, health tip would be and the most overrated health tip or most yeah. overrated health myth? Trend out there? Yeah. I think the most underrated is the intuition. I think people have forgotten what it feels like to sleep well, to eat well, to have energy, because we've been told by wearables what we're supposed to be feeling and what we're supposed to be doing, and people have lost that connection to themselves. So that intuition of actually understanding our body and using things like rating of perceived exertion without any of the tools, I think that's one of the most underrated but one of the most effective means of invoking change. When I look on the other end of things, it's all those top end, like the 1% that you should be looking at, like peptides or um, fasting. Let's just bring it back to basics. How are you eating? What are you eating? When are you eating? How are you sleeping? It's like the big four is the mindfulness, the sleep, the physical activity, and the nutrition. If we focus on those, then we can start to really see change. Is when we start going outside the box and really focusing on all the biohacking and the bro science that's out there is when we start to lose sight of where we should be and get into the overrated trends that tend to take over everybody's mentality. What is your take on saunas and cold plunges, cold, you know, therapy? Mm -hmm. Saunas, I love. Uh, I started as an environmental exercise physiologist. So I look at how the heat can invoke positive change on the body. Um, it doesn't have to be a large dose. It could be 10 to 15 minutes in a finished sauna three times a week. Because uh, we start to see massive cardiovascular improvements, blood pressure improvements included in that, metabolic changes. So we have better blood glucose control. We have better gut health, brain health. So many great things happen with the heat. When we think about cold plunge for women, it's cool water. It's around 15 degrees Celsius, which is around that 56, 57 degree Fahrenheit mark. Ice is too cold. And we don't get the same kind of response that men do when we get into ice. It's too strong of a stress and the body rebounds with too much sympathetic drive, too much constriction. Where if it's cool water, we're going to invoke initially a vagal response, which is that, <gasps> and then the body is going to get that more parasympathetic relaxation response that we're looking for for cold plunge. So what happens if we do the cool therapy? I mean, because I hate it, I, I, you know, but, and I won't do it. And I get a lot of, you know, slack for that. But what does it do yeah. to the body in layman's terms? Like, what does it do to a woman's body when they jump into a cold plunge? So because if you're, I think it's, a woman, it's you're good jumping for them. In, yeah. So you're jumping into that icy cold water and you're getting that shock. And that shock is... Um, a sympathetic so that you, you have your flight or fight sensation, which is your sympathetic drive, mm -hmm. and you have that deep relaxation, which is your parasympathetic drive. For women, we get that shock and that sympathetic drive, which increases cortisol, increases um, our blood glucose and our free fatty acids because the body's like, ah, what is this incredible shock? I've got to get out and run away. For cool water, it's not as intense, so you don't get that sympathetic. You get the initial... <gasps> And then the body's like, okay, I can deal with this. I'm going to do some vasoconstriction. I'm going to put more blood sugar to the brain so that the brain understands what's going on and uh, stimulates what we call the vagal nerve. So the vagal nerve is what that parasympathetic nervous system is attached to. So it invokes that calming and you can stay in it, take some deep breaths. But that said, heat does so much more for a woman's body and then cold plunge. So if we're looking for increased parasympathetic drive, we're looking for better metabolic control, we're getting better hormonal control, it's all instigated by sauna work, not by cold plunge. 
So a finished sauna is usually like 200 degrees or 210 sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. If I have a sauna that's like this infrared that doesn't get hot enough, it's like it takes forever to get to 160 and even that takes four hours. Can uh. I still get you it? Know, because at the time it was, everyone's like, oh, the infrared is the best sauna for your body. It doesn't warm my body. I'm like cold. Half. Mm -mm. I'm shivering in my sauna. <laughs> Yeah, I know. That's <laughs> crazy. I mean, but do I, if I wait long enough and it gets to 165, I'm lucky. Yeah. Um, do you still get the same benefits as you would in a finished sauna if it's an infrared sauna? So the thing with the infrared is it really bypasses when the initial thermoregulation control centers. If you get to a point where it's hot enough and you get that sweat onset and you feel mm -hmm. really uncomfortable, then you're hot enough. But you don't have to like stay in there for a half an hour or more being uncomfortable. You bring it up to your sweat response and then you can get out. Um, and I think that's what people don't like. They're like, oh, I get an infrared and I get warm, but I don't sweat. I'm like, but you need that. You need that uncomfortable heat and uncomfortable sweating to invoke the change. No, I wish I did sweat. It doesn't get hot. These things don't get that very hot. Have you ever been in one? Like mm -hmm. these things are like 50 degrees much cooler than the finished saunas. Yeah. So. My um, my stepdad has one, but we have a finished sauna. So I use our finish Smart. and then I go to my parents' house and I'm like, I'm freezing in your sauna. <laughs> <laughs> I know. That's what I'm saying. It's like a cold plunge. I mean, it's like yeah. crazy. It's so not hot, but... I don't know. I mean, so you believe that the, the that's kind of all hype, the infrared sauna, because it, yeah. it gets maybe your skin a little bit warm. Red. Maybe warm. you put on one of those sauna suits they sell in like Kmart or Walmart, and you wear the sauna suit in your sauna. <laughs> <laughs> or just get a new sauna and call it a day, right? Get a new sauna. Yeah, yeah. do that. That's the best th way to do it, yeah. I think that's a great idea. 